Welcome to the God is Not an Asshole podcast. If you are one of the many people done with religious dogmatism, hang on. You might sense transcendence, but your church or other faith community never seem to get off the ground. You realize that honoring your conscience means more than fitting in and keeping hard to explain rules? Hang on. You could probably think of the goodness in your tradition, and you tried your best to save that baby, but there's so much bathwater. Join your host, David Norman Moore Jr. in California and Carrie Connolly in New Jersey, who are collaborating to bring on guests who have found life on the other side of fundamentalism. Guests with stories of how they have liberated themselves from beliefs that divide us from each other. None of our guests' narratives are identical, but we hope you'll find something in common with each of them. We invite you to experience our common bond as we all inspire even more of us to embrace the true self. So I am so excited. This is Carrie here. I am so excited to introduce our guest today, Dr. Christina Cleveland, the author of God is Not Is God is a Black Woman. And I'm going to go ahead and read you her amazing bio. Dr. Christina Cleveland is a social psychologist, public theologian, author, and activist. She is the founder and director of of the Center for Justice and Renewal, which supports a more equitable world by nurturing skillful justice advocacy and the depth to act on it. Dr. Cleveland integrates psychology, theology, storytelling, and art to help justice seekers sharpen their understanding of the social realities that maintain injustice while also stimulating the soul's enormous capacity to resist and transform those realities. Dr. Cleveland holds holds a PhD in social psychology from the University of California, Santa Barbara, a BA from Dartmouth College, where she double majored in sociology and psychological and brain sciences, as well as an honorary doctorate from the Virginia Theological Seminary. An award-winning researcher and author, Dr. Cleveland is a Ford Foundation fellow who has held faculty positions at several institutions of higher education most recently at Duke University's Divinity School, where she was the first African-American and first female director of the Duke Center for Reconciliation, and also led a research team investigating self-compassion as a buffer to racial stress. In 2022, she published her second full-length book, God is a Black Woman with HarperCollins, which details her 400-mile walking pilgrimage across central France in search of ancient Black Madonna statues and examines the relationship among race, gender, and cultural perceptions of the divine. I am so excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Cleveland. Welcome. Me too. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. (laughs) Well, let me just say, yes, thank you, Carrie, for uh, sharing that. And, um, you know, I have some some things to bounce off of you, uh, not necessarily, but partially related (laughs) to um, the fact that uh, we, we've we known each other for quite a few years. Um, um, so there are, uh, you, you know, footnotes to your life that maybe uh, not as many people would know, like you worked for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, I did. <laughs> that was back when I was going to your church. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah, um, I was just going to say there's some things I wanted to, I've been looking forward to bouncing off of you, but uh, I was thinking that, um, well, first of all, Carrie sounds like she has something to ask. And then also, I would like for you to just kind of where you are in this moment in history, just, you know, share, uh, you know, your place on the trajectory of life. Okay, sure. And I'll also add, um, my first trip to Sub-Saharan Africa was with Pastor David. That's oh, right. That's, that's right. so cool. <laughs> you got, you know, you really get to know people when you travel together. <laughs> we do. Yes. <laughs> it was lovely. I, I, it was wonderful because we went to Kenya and we went to Rwanda. And um, I'll never forget the time that we were in Rwanda. And um, we were... On like on our way to church um, on a Saturday or Sunday, and Pastor David got a call 
to like hop on a plane to go to Burundi and preach at the church there. And we just, like, like looked around the group of like five of us and was like, who wants to preach in my place? <laughs> <laughs> like, he was supposed to be preaching at the church in Rome that day. <laughs> And my mom, who was also a pastor, was like, I'll do it. And so my mom totally just preached that day. <laughs> that is an awesome I story. About that. And another another footnote to all of that is that I was just days out of a medical emergency. Oh, that's right. Yes. And I went to Africa. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, I remember um before before I went under, uh, you know, the anesthesiologist was there and the surgeon was there. And I remember asking while I'm laying there on the gurney, um, will I still be able to go to to um, to Africa or whatever or Kenya or whatever it is? I asked Rwanda. That's what I asked. Will I still be able to go to Rwanda? And the doctor asked, "Well, when do you plan to go?" And I said, "Wednesday." <laughs> and and um, he said, "Well, if you're prepared to only have fluids." Because uh, I wouldn't, I wasn't going to be able to eat anything and uh, and be in a lot of pain. I said, okay. And part of the reason I didn't want to suspend it is because Christina, you and your mom and whoever else had already oh, bought David, tickets. David went, yeah, David went with us. That yeah, we, well, we were going to see Jackie O'Witty's mom too. That's right. Yes, we have a mm-hmm. you know a mutual friend. Uh, and um, actually, David wasn't scheduled to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, my, that's my, my son, my oldest son. He wasn't scheduled to go. But after my accident, um, people raised money so that he could go and watch me. You know, baby, Aww. you know, two dads sit me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great story. I was like, well, I'm two, glad. Six, maybe. Yeah, I think it's 2006 or something like 2007 maybe yeah i think so yeah. wow. wow that's amazing well so dr cleveland i would love to just dive into this conversation with you and um i'm i think where i would love to start if it's okay um is i would love to wonder or or have you kind of explain to those people in our audience who might not be familiar with the Black Madonna or the Black Madonnas, um, what they are. And um, and also, while you're at it, if you could also explain womanism to our, our readers. Oh, right. um, because, they, you know, those yeah. two things, I think, are very interrelated. And I don't think that um, not everybody has heard of womanism or understands it. And no. uh, yeah, yeah, so please... Sure. So the Black Madonnas are most associated with the Catholic Church and are are dark-skinned Black versions of the Virgin Mary. And so, you know, the vast majority of Virgin Marys are white, pale skin, porcelain skin, that kind of stuff. But there's a very small percentage, less than 1%, that are Black and have been Black since, since the beginning of Christianity. Um, so that's, that's what a black Madonna is, is a black Mary. Um, but the Catholic church, um, she's really just a Christianized version of, but of older goddesses. And so if you look back across human history for the first 10 to 20,000 years, depending on which archeologists you talk to, um, humans only worshiped a female God and more often than not, she was black mainly because they associated her with the earth and they saw the earth as the source of life. And so she was black. It just made sense. Um, And so a lot of those old black goddesses, so we're talking Artemis, we're talking Isis, we're talking Chabelle or Sybil, um, Demeter, um, those were all black. And when the Catholic church came, Christianized the pagan world, told people they had to stop worshiping the goddesses. People were like, sure, whatever. Um, And just basically continued that worship um, of the old goddesses through the Black Madonna. 
And so now we think of her as Catholic, but she's really not Catholic. And if you, well, she is, and she's not, she's, she's a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um, If you look around the the African diaspora, you see Black Madonnas all over Africa. You see Black Madonnas all over South America. Um, And so you see her showing up in Yoruban deities. You you see her showing up in like voodoo, condomble, um, all sorts of like really cool syncretistic um, South American um, religions. And so I just think, I think of her as, as one example of what I call the sacred black feminine. She's, Mm -hmm. she's an image of black female sacredness. Um, and that's why she's important to me, um, because she affirms my sacredness and she invites me into a different relationship with the divine that takes into account a broader spectrum of, um, of, of the divine's gender and race. So that's the Black Madonna. There are over 450 around the world um, of official Black Madonnas. And by official, I mean the Catholic Church has said, yes, this is one of them. Mm. <laughs> and, and usually they're associated with the earth. They're usually associated with um, with existing pre-existing goddess worship. So they're very, they're very, there's a reason why they're prominent in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, because those were those are old, old existing communities. And so they go back to ancient times. Um, and then um, she's also um, but the, the official ones have have some sort of legacy of like miracles associated with them that have like stamped approved by the Catholic Church. <laughs> they right, sit right. out there to say, oh, OK, you know, to survey the people and OK, this this really happened. You know, she really did. Um you know, cried tears of blood or, you know, whatever people say that she did. So those are the Black Madonnas. They're pretty much on every continent except for Antarctica. And like, I don't think there are any in New Zealand, Australia, but they're in Asia, they're in South America, they're in North America, they're in Europe, they're in Africa. Um, And then womanism is, you know, depends on who you talk to, but (laughs) it's, it's, it's a Black feminist interpretation of the world um, that takes that takes seriously um, morality from the perspective of what's healing and life giving for Black women. Um, the assumption being, if it's healing and life giving for Black women, including Black trans women, then it's good for all of us. Um, and I would say womanists are a, li- a little bit distinct from Black feminists in the sense that womanists do tend to be more interested in religion and spirituality um, and more interested in the institutional church. Not always, but oftentimes you see womanists working as Christian theologians, um, as Buddhist theologians, as some sort of, you know, interested in sort of institutional church, institutional religion, and trying to reclaim that to a certain extent. So, you know, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with the term. Sometimes I'm interested in doing that. Sometimes I'm like, ah, burn it down. You know, it just depends. <laughs> so I'd say I'm like half woman, half Black feminist, because I can really, I really resonate with both groups. Mm, Obviously, that's- my, my history is in the church, so I, I, I'm, I will always care about the church because it's part of who I am. Um, and Pastor David knows my pedigree. It's quite ridiculous in the black. Okay, let me let me just jump in, uh, Christina. <laughs> See, talking about your history being in the church and your pedigree, yeah. you know, there's one person that um, I wonder even if you got some of her, whatever her DNA or whatever. But Ernestine Cleveland, right? Now, the late, no, the I late, a great DNA. <laughs> yes, yes, and. Um, you know, she, she just asked questions. She challenged. And I remember, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I attended, uh, the, uh, convocation in Los Angeles at West Angeles. And this is before they ever had plenary speakers that were female, uh, in the main sessions, uh, at night, but only during the daytime. Anyway, and, and, and when they had Women's Day, the women would go to the larger facility. I remember going, I remember go, Ernestine Cleveland was the uh, speaker for this event. I remember in the, in West Angeles Cathedral, being the only male in the room, at least presenting. Um, and you know, these thousands of women and the men were having, you know, a different event across the street. And it spoke to me of how 
I mean, what an amazing woman she was and how she challenged um, the status quo. But it was almost to me like the men were not interested. Um, And to me, it was like I had never seen her before in person. And so this might be the only time and proved to be the only time I would see her in person. So why would I go and and be part of something that's going to, you know, another version of that's going to happen the next day or the next year. Why not? And, and so, uh, I mean, I had so much respect for her journey. I mean, she was an amazing preacher too, but just her story. And maybe you could talk about her and how you connect with her. Sure. Sure. So she's my great aunt. She's my grandfather's little sister. My grandfather's still alive. She's, she's to see, she actually died a month before, um, my book came out. Um, and, just to give context to the impact that she had in her community, she she start she started her own denomination and church in Oakland because our family's Church of God in Christ, which does not ordain women, and she has more ministerial gifting in her pinky than all all her brothers did and combined. <laughs> yet, <laughs> yet she could not preach and they could, and so she was like, "Forget this! I'm going to start my own thing." And she was really forward thinking because back when I was a kid, you know, in the 80s and 90s, her church in Oakland, Center of Hope, had a home for women who were fleeing domestic violence. They had drug um, addiction outreach programs. They had far more integrated and uh, proactive and structurally, you know, addressing structural issues around homelessness. I mean, this is stuff that Christians in general weren't really doing, but specifically Black Holiness Pentecostals were not doing because it was all about separation. And she was doing all that work. And when she died in January 2022, um, I believe it was 2022, um, all the all the flags in Oakland were, were hung at half mast in honor of her. So that's just the impact in that community that she's had. Um, and I think it'd be really hard to find a Black church historian who would not put her on the top 10 list of best preachers in the history of America, like of any race. She's, yeah. She was unbelievable. And when I, um, <laughs> when I applied for my job at, at Duke, um, at the Divinity School, I, you know, I, I, the, the search committee told me, you're fabulous, we like you, just so you know, when you come to campus, you're going to have to convince the theologians that you're theological enough because I'm a social psychologist and you're going to have to convince the black church studies folks that you're black enough essentially. Cause I was coming to do reconciliation and, or, or, you know, what was called reconciliation. And so, so I came and I did my thing. I actually ended up getting the job. And then after the fact, Willie Jennings, who's a famous black um, theologian, black theologian who was at Duke at the time now is at Yale. He came up to me after I got the job and said, Christina. And I said, he said, and I said, yeah, Willie. He's like, I didn't know you were one of those Clevelands. <laughs> and I, said, yeah, I didn't think to mention it. He's like, you should have led with that. <laughs> He's like, you want us over. But if you would have said great granddaughter of Bishop E.E. Cleveland, mm-hmm. you would have had us from jump, you know? Wow. Um, and so I, and that, you know, that was, somewhat new to me because I didn't, even though I was raised around the Clevelands, I didn't know the impact around, literally around the world that, you know, my great grandfather have had, that Honor seen had, um, several other family members. And it's not just on that side of the family. My mom's dad is a bishop in Kojic too. So, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but I will say um, a lot of this, I, I think I got a lot of Honor Steen spunk <laughs> and her rabble rousing. Yes. And um, and I also think, you know, one of the things I like about her that I would say I'm I'm in the same you know lineage is she's very interested in like burning things down, but she's just as interested in building new things. Mm-hmm. And in my book, I, I I take, you know, I take down white male God, but I also prop up the sacred black feminine, and there's imagination there. And there's prophetic gifting there that I, I attribute to honor esteem because I think anybody can say, oh, that, that didn't work or that's so poison. Let's just throw it away. It's a lot harder to say, um, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So let's reclaim as much as we can. And then let's build on that. 
And I don't think I could have done that without, without, you know, that her, her influence and other family members who've done that. Um, so that's beautiful. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad of- you articulated that because, you know, some of the, uh, the podcast listeners here are, um, you know, are going to be, uh, people who have some connection or have had some connection with the church of God in Christ, um, including myself, but they're, uh, they're going to wonder, you know, especially, well, they might wonder who is this Christina Cleveland and what is she about and why is she so <laughs> different? And is she, you know, what kind of heretic is she? And, and I you love know, a good heretic. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing is, is that you are just, uh, you are the eventuation of uh, what I think is the core of um, of the, the the black church experience. And when I'm not speaking institutionally, but I'm mm-hmm. talk to, talking ethically mm-hmm. and historically, you are the eventuation of that, and you refuse to to, to get stuck um, mm-hmm. um, because everything changes. Everything evolves uh if it's going to stay alive Hmm. well i do feel like it's interesting because oftentimes um when i'm when i'm asked about my upbringing in uh, you know in my book i in my book it was it was it was necessary and important for me to show how the problem of white male god exists in every space. And so I do talk about how white male God was present in my home growing up. I do talk about how white male God was present in black church spaces yes. growing up. Um, so I, I, I don't necessarily um, highlight the most positive aspects of growing up or the my black church experiences, because that's not what the book was about. Right. Um, but I will say there's there the only way, the only way I was able to see pictures of the black Madonna become enraptured, not knowing any French, get on a plane to France, not being outdoorsy, actually being indoorsy, decide to walk 400 miles across mountains and show up at these statues and say, okay, God, do something. There's no way I could have done that without being a Black Pentecostal. There's no mm-hmm. Because we're the only people who would do something like that. <laughs> the Holy Ghost. Because <laughs> we're the only people who, 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 I mean, what was so instilled in me is God is active, God is present, yes. God is doing things. We just have to expect it. And I've been in all sorts of churches. I wrote a book about di- differences in churches. So I've I've been in pr- just about every Christian denominational, denominational space, and nobody teaches that. Um, that theology of the Holy Spirit, like the Black Church does, mm-hmm. you can't find it. There are people who try to try to, um, you know, like Vineyard, who try to do like a suburban version of it or whatever, you know. But nobody does it like the Black Church, where you're just so desperate that you're like, God, better do something because what? There's no other alternative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Open. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so I, you know, it's like, even though my book isn't explicitly a Black Pentecostal book, it is implicitly a Black Pentecostal. And that's womanism yeah. too, because I think womanism um, is, ver- is very interested in bringing our experiences, our impulses, trusting that they're good, trusting that they're in alignment with the divine, trusting that, that the divine will like lovingly point out misalignment and and bringing that to bear too. So there were lots of times when I was visiting these like ancient statues and I would just come up with my own name for them. Like they have their official historical name, but based on my experience, I'd come up with my own name. And I end up using a lot of those names in the book. Like Our Lady of the Sick, I call she who cherishes our hot mess. And like um, the Our Lady of the Fountain, I call she whose thick thighs save lives. So based on my personal interaction with them, I'm like renaming God. Mm. At first, I thought that was kind of weird, but I was like, I'm just going to go with it because like this, this feels right to me. I'm going to trust my like womanist intuition. And then after the fact, I'm working on a second book on the Black Madonna now. So I'm going and I'm reading all these medieval and ancient stories about how people have interacted with the Black Madonna. And I've discovered that is since the beginning, people have named her. Mm. Always had her official names. And then she's always had the people's names. You know, you make me so, think of how the, the the 
you know, and woman's, womanist theologians will be quick to point this out, that throughout the Hebrew scriptures and the uh, Christian texts, there is only one person who actually names God, gives God a name. Hagar. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hagar is the one. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And so, you know, it's, it's, but again, it's like, I didn't know that history and I certainly wasn't thinking of Hagar when I was um, like on my journey, Yeah, but it's just, again, that womanist intuition, that, that sort of black Pentecostal, um, just trusting the experience, trusting the experience as much as tradition and orthodoxy, you know, um, and always being open to what God might do. So that, that was power, you know, it's, it's powerful it continues to be powerful. Well, Carrie, I know you have something. I have more questions to, to bounce off of Christina, but go ahead, Carrie. So thank you. Um, I, I have a, so many things. First of all, I'm, I, I appreciate your explanation of womanism because in seminary, I was, I've only ever been introduced to womanism through a theological lens. So yeah. to hear it being introduced as, as something other than the theological first. Um, that, that's a new paradigm shift for me. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, one of the, I'm so, I kind of don't know which way I want to go now because we've talked about so many things, but I'm so, um, I, I'm so enthralled with the idea of embodiment and spirituality as a mystic myself, more from Celtic traditions, but the embodiment of, um, of specifically of, of women's spirituality. Um, being an embodied experience and being something that is uh, outside of orthodoxy usually um, and mm -hmm. is something that is deeply mystical um, and experiential. I'm fascinated with that. I'm also fascinated with the ways in which systems of dominance have usurped the language around light and dark, mm -hmm. um, making darkness to be something that is evil, right? Mm -hmm. Even when it's usually associated with the feminine divine, right? This idea of the womb, the womb of potential, of creation. Um, so I've been ill at ease for a long time with, with the ways in which um, the institutional church talks about light and dark, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really, I would love to hear you speak a little bit more about, because you go into it in the book a lot, um, mm -hmm. about the difference between the white white male god, the patriarchy, the disembodiedness of whiteness, um, the disembodiedness of of patriarchy, and the grittiness of of living in a human body, right? Of of what giving birth is like, right? Like this idea that birth is a is a blood and guts kind of a of, a, of an experience that the Madonna went through. That um, and and this idea of of experiential embodied mysticism and mystical faith. I would love to hear you just talk a little bit about what comes up for you when, how, how does that embodied faith differ from perhaps yeah. other experiences of specifically Christianity? Yeah. You know, I think the thing that comes to mind the most, I mean, I could probably talk for days about this and it's part of the reason why it was so important for me to walk to all the black Madonnas or, you know, ride share or whatever, but not just rent a car and drive to them. Mm -hmm. Um, because I wanted to drop into my body and be more present in my body. And I, um, when I, when I first started leaning into contemplative mystical spirituality, of course I started with like, um, you know, like the Catholic tradition and the Richard Rohr led type, type, type spaces. And then I, you know, I spent some time in Buddhist spaces too, cause they tend to do contemplative spirituality pretty well, or at least have structures to support it. Um, and it was a lot of meditation, a lot of sitting meditation, <laughs> which you know, I'm pretty disciplined. I can do that. And I found some, I think I'm such a contemplative at heart that like, in a sense, my soul was just like, this is actually what I've been longing for, you know, mm -hmm. is that just sitting here in silence <laughs> for mm -hmm. days. I mean, I would go to long retreats just to practice. And, but when I got connected to walking meditation, in contemplative walking, that's when it all started. That's when I started to have the level of insights and things would come up and I would notice things about my life, about my beliefs, about my relationships that I would have, I think I would have never noticed without being in my body. Okay. And so since then, I really nurtured an embodiment practice through a lot. I'm part of so many like different embodiment groups. And every single time I have a deep 
insight while I'm just playing or, you know, and I actually just downloaded a book that I'm so excited to read. Um, it's an Alice Walker book that's like, you know, like something about like these times are for like furious dancing or something like that. Mm, okay. I haven't read it. You know, I literally just downloaded it yesterday, but I'm excited because I think it's these times like now where things are so uncertain instead of a term like to not use the term dark, <laughs> uncertain um, or uh, in progress. Um, that that furious dancing is what's going to bring the wisdom to the surface, both individually and in community. Um, and so I'll say that, but I think um, but the thing that comes to mind the most about embodiment is, mm-hmm. and probably why whiteness and patriarchy hate it, is because it puts the wisdom back in, it, it, puts, it puts the locus of wisdom back in the individual. Yep. And it puts the locus of knowledge and spiritual authority back with the individual. And when those individuals happen to be female or black or brown, as in not white, straight, Mm -hmm. male, right, then that's a dangerous thing, right? Because it's dangerous for even white males who um, don't toe the party party line because they're Mm -hmm. absolutely right. Yeah. So anybody Mm -hmm. threatens the system. Mm-hmm. He's going to be um, lynched. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Speaking of, uh, uh, this is kind of a, a, a shift uh, in the <laughs> conversation, but what are your thoughts on the interrogation of Claudine Gay at mm-hmm. Harvard? Yeah, well, yeah. I don't have a lot of thoughts, to be honest. Um, I, I haven't been following it super closely. We did go to the same high school, and I'm part of a Black alumni group that's been following it. People have been commenting on that. Um, I'm, I, it feels like a witch hunt. It feels like um, well, someone, someone in the group that's been paying more attention to it than I have um, said, um, it's almost as if s- these people are saying, uh, back in 1986, she jaywalked. And mm-hmm. now they do <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. um, and so to, to me, you know, it, it kind of goes with what, with what, what we've been talking about when women, particularly black women, um, who I think, um, deal with both the anti-blackness and, you know, misogyny, um, are, have any sort of power and authority, people are going to be coming for them and they're going to find any reason <clears throat> to disqualify them. There's a, I mean, I, I mean, Amoya Bailey's work on the Saj Noir, the hatred of black women just feels very urgent and necessary for these times. Yeah. Um, th- you know, we have to remember that this is the institution where Cornell West couldn't get tenure. So. Right. Yeah. Well, we're talking Harvard. Yeah. For folks who don't know who Claudine Gay is, she's the president of Harvard um, University, the first black president and the first black female president. There has been a female president, but she's the first black female president. And she's yeah. probably the first BIPOC female president. Yeah. Um, and so. And yeah. she's currently under investigation for plagiarism going back. I think she did in like. If her dissertation right. that like, was like two lines, which is interesting because and she did resign. Oh, she did. I didn't know yes. she was resigned. today. Yes. I just today. Saw that oh, today. Okay. Yeah, I haven't been online all day. Okay, so yeah, so you know, it's um, and someone, someone in the group that I'm a part of said, um, if you're going to do this to her, we need to send every college president's dissertation through That's current. What I was thinking yeah, through current because now we have software. Yes. I mean, I wrote a 170-page dissertation when I was at UCSB. Um, I'm guessing if someone sent that through current software, they would find one or two lines yep. that's yep. too similar to what somebody else wrote. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even though I can assure you, I didn't plagiarize. Okay, right. not Christina. Intention- unintentionally, because I know what plagiarism is. So I didn't right. do it intentionally. Like- we, we also share uh, some awareness and presence with a... A, a, a college that's here in Santa Barbara, and that's Westmont. Westmont. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, right now, I mean, just a week ago, I had coffee with a friend who uh, basically got fired. Um, he happens to be Indian American. And, you know, they. It, it's, it's amazing how you can sidestep process 
in order to refuse tenure. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens, ironically or coincidentally, that part of our, as part of our congregation, there's a woman. Maybe you remember Robina Bati? I don't know if you remember. Um, I don't think I know that name. Okay. Well, she taught at Westmont and she was denied tenure 30 years ago. Wow. And then she went on to become uh, department head of global studies at Monterey, uh, Cal State Monterey. Mm. Um, and it seems like everybody, it, it, I mean, we have women of color. We have people of color as my friend that I had coffee with last week and women in general who I was, I was consoling my friend because I mean, he, he has, fa he has a, fa a young family, you know, I was consoling him. Um, and I, I mentioned you, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a few other people saying that everybody who leaves Westmont, you know, uh, you know, in, under less uh, than, than appealing conditions, goes on to do great things. <laughs> you know, I mean, think about it. Diana Butler Bass. Oh, interesting. You know, I didn't know she was there. Okay. She was fired. You know, you know why she was fired? Because she got divorced. Her husband cheated on her. And, uh, and the school fired her. Wow. And now wow. she's, now Diana, now she's bigger than the school. Than the school. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, as you were talking just now, I was thinking about how you, I read, I remember reading your blog back in the day. And I think the title was something like the worst year of my life or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I was there for two years and I, it was horrible. Yeah. Um, it was, I was the only African-American faculty member. And I was one of, I think, six tenure track female faculty. So, it, it, but, but my biggest sin was I was unmarried yeah. amongst mm -hmm. all those things. So, you, you know, uh, I, I heard someone say um, a week ago that somehow they were able to fly under the radar and be considered respectable in a place like Southern California. When in fact they are really Liberty West. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's pretty That's fast. Yeah. Wow. That's scary. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. We are people who have left behind performance based religion and the shame that comes with it. Maybe you have a personal liberation story to tell and we want to know about it. Please contact us on Twitter at God is not an asshole or text 805 703 83. Nine, three, because the world needs to know that God is not an asshole.